Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and in this video we go going to prepare a RF85 which is a Van Diemen race car a Formula 4 2000 for an upcoming event I'm not going to do a full restoration on this car I want to get it track ready and see how it goes then we do a shakedown with it and then we'll see how further we go with this car if I was to do a complete rebuild on this car then I would have to take everything apart and the car is in a fairly good condition it has been racing until last year so it is as good as track ready but there are a few things that I need to sort out and I'll show you those in a few minutes and then of course we have our normal maintenance procedures where we go in to change all the liquids we go in to check the brakes as well the brake pads the brake discs and so on we'll make sure that all the bolts are tight and then hopefully we can take this car back to the racetrack and you might remember that I picked up this car in Denmark last year because this car has quite some history in the Danish racing on the Formula Ford 2000. But let me give you some history on this car. This Van Diemen RF85 was built in 1985 and it started its life in Denmark. And it was bought by Jesper Willemsen, who is in Denmark a very well-known racer. Maybe not outside Europe, but if you live in Europe then you might know this guy. And he actually won with this specific race car twice the National Formula 4 2000 Championship in 1986 and 1987. Of course, it wasn't painted in blue. It was white with the Commodore 64 logo on it. And for those of you that remember old computers, you know what I mean with Commodore 64. And I just might over time repaint it with the same original colors. It's a bit of work, but who knows? But first of all, I'm going to do a shakedown with it on a track and then we'll see how far we go. Jasper introduced Tom Christensen to Formula Ford 2000 racing and he has used this car for Tom Christensen. This was Tom Christensen's first debut car. And for those of you that might not know Tom Christensen, I think you probably should because he is world known. He is the most successful driver in the 24 hours of Le Mans and I believe he had six consecutive wins so he beats all the records. So he's a very well known race driver not only with Formula Ford but also later on. So this car has quite some history to it. I have all the evidence, I have all the pictures from those days that is why I bought this car because I think it has a lot of historical value. Maybe not top of the line, but it has some history to it and that is so nice to have. So now let's see what we have to do to get this car back on the track because there's a couple of things we need to sort out. These racing cars are really a lot of fun to drive on the track. And the good thing is you can still get most of the parts because this racing car is fitted with a Ford Pinto 2 liter engine for which most of the parts are still available, except some as I have experienced. And in this video we're going to do a couple of things. We will have to sort out the dashboard and uh, replace some of the switches, but you can see the dashboard has been cut off here on the top. And they put a big warning light up. This is a warning light, I think it's even an LED light, uh, which indicates that the oil pressure has dropped, that's gone. So then you see that immediately while you're racing, I think I'm going to remove this. I don't like this. This is not very pretty, but then again, we don't build things to be pretty. And uh, I'm going to rebuild this whole plastic panel here with an aluminum panel and then we powder coat it. So that's one of the things I certainly want to do. Now this car is fitted with a dry sump and it has an oil reservoir on the side here. So we'll clean all this up and make sure that the inside is clean. We'll make sure that all the hoses are right so we have no leaks. And we'll also have to check the oil pump. I mentioned before that this car has a dry sump, so that means that there is no real oil pan underneath. In fact, it's a very slim one. And this oil pump here, which is a three-stage pump, will suck out that oil and then pushes it back to the reservoir and the filter and then back into the engine. This is what this pump is there for. So this is a high volume, high pressure pump. And it's typically used in racing technology uh, because if you have a real sump underneath the engine, then in the curves, because of the G-forces, the oil may swing to one side and you actually may have gaps in your oil supply to your engine, which you don't really want to get. 
In addition, your crankshaft, which is rotating normally uh, in your pan, uh, will swipe up oil and it's kind of resistant, so you're gonna lose some power. With a dry sump, you don't have that issue at all. But as you can see, um, we probably have some oil leaks here and there and these hoses are not in such a great condition anymore. So those I will most likely replace and then we'll see where we take it. The pump is actually driven by a belt which sits here on the side. And I just want to make sure that we have sufficient tension on that belt. So, or even replace the belt if necessary. We find the cooling radiators on the left and on the right hand side and they are really exposed. There is an intake in the front here. So this is how we're cooling it. I think that will be all right. Although I'm not too sure about the hoses that are rubbing against the frame here. This is also something to be checked and making sure that we have no surprises because that's the last thing you want to get. And of course we will change all the spark plugs and if you're worried what this kind of stuff is, this is kind of a heat protection for your cables, for your spark plugs. So that probably will go off and I'll probably put some new stuff up. Uh, I don't know yet, it depends. And it still looks in a fairly good condition, but still uh, it looks a bit tacky. Have a look on the header here, how that is curved and how all of these are having about the same length. And there's a very good reason for this one. You want to have an exhaust which is minimum restrictive. So when the gases flow out, they all have more or less the same trajectory to go through the pipes. And that flow of gases at high RPMs creates kind of a suction pump for the inlet, especially if you're going to drive with a 300 degree camshaft or more. So that is very important. And these headers here, they look pretty much all right. So I don't need to do anything on this, at least not for now. The gearbox is the M8 gearbox from Hewland. So we have four gears forward, one gear backwards. Unfortunately, it's an H, so it's not a sequential box. But I have different pinions for that box. So depending on which circuit you're gonna drive, you're going to change the pinions or the gears actually inside that gearbox. And to be honest, uh, that all looks uh, to be in a pretty, pretty good shape. So there isn't a lot to be done on that. The carburetor on this engine is a Weber Degas 38 and you have to have this if you want to have papers on this car that is compliant with historical racing according to FIA because there are limitations of what you can do. You see cars with double Webers on it, that's also possible, but in this class you should be racing with the Weber Degas. I have actually a new one here which is exactly the same one as you can see. Uh, so here you go. So I could actually fit that one up if I wanted to, but I won't because this is an original one. The other one that I have here is an aftermarket one. So uh, made in Spain. This one is made in Italy. Of course, I'm going to change the filters out and uh, make them all clean again. And then we check all the jets, clean it all up, making sure that the float level is right. You know, all the standard stuff to adjust the degas. If you're interested on how to clean up and adjust and calibrate and baseline a degas carburetor, then have a look on my YouTube channel. I've got lots of videos on that. And for the rest, uh, we don't need to do a lot more on this side. Uh, let's have a look where we have the gas tank, but also where we have the ignition and what type of ignition we have on this car. And here you have the mechanical fuel pump. Now, typically I'm not too keen on this, but I can understand why they have it because this car has a small battery and you start it with an eight because you want to reduce the weight. It has no charging capability. There's no alternator on the engine just to save weight and save actually on the loss of horsepower. So that's often why you still find a mechanical fuel pump. In some combinations, uh, you'll find a combination of an electrical one and a mechanical one. So when you start up, you use your um, electrical one and once the engine is running because then this pump starts to work then you switch over to this one so but this car doesn't have that on the top here we have the standard ignition system uh, we have a optocoupler pickup in the distributor and then we have the illumination typical electronic ignition which is allowed on this type of a car so that's about it for the ignition system and the fuel system not really anything special this is the eight to start the car. So you need to have this big connector here that you're gonna put in. And now you attach this to an external battery with these clamps that you have here that goes to your external battery 
to start up the car to get it going. That way you save on the battery inside the car. This race car already has the Nova gas installed. This was an after installation. Here you can see the nozzle and this is going to spray out this Nova gas to kill the flames. There's a couple of jets around in the engine bay, but also in the cockpit. And on top of it, you see the oil cooler, which was added later. It's held in place with some tie wraps, but that should be okay. That doesn't really matter. Uh, I might make a better bracket on it. I'm not sure yet. We'll see how that goes. Here you see one of the nozzles that we have in the cockpit. There's one on the left, one on the right. And then of course, this is the stick shift. Uh, and this is an H pattern. So um, not all that good, but good enough. Uh, that's how it was. And then, um, yeah, the rest you can see the dashboard. We talked about this already. And right here, of course, we can then put the steering wheel on. And all the way on the bottom, we have the brackets for the fire extinguishing system. And that is Novacas. And here is that bottle that will have to go in there and, and we'll, we'll mount it once we are getting that far. In fact, it has to be mounted in the other direction. Not a lot of space, but that's what we will have to do. This is the battery and it is a gel battery, so it can lay flat. I, I do prefer to have it upright, but this is the way it was installed. And as you can see, it's not really held in place properly. There is a cover over it, but I will have to sort this out because I don't like it this way. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do it. I might even move it out more to the front, maybe. We'll see. No idea yet. But this is the gas tank. It's an aluminum gas tank that was put in later. Normally you would have the seat here. But the seat for me is too far backwards, so I need to fix that. But let me get the seat and show you what I mean. Seats in racing are not really something very comfortable, as we all know. right? So this is the seat that normally goes in there, as you can see, like so. But that is way too far backwards for me. I really need to move the seat at least this far forward. So I'm talking about five to six centimeters more forward. So we will have to make a bracket here to support it. We have to support it better on the side. And I will have to make the adjustments for the seat belts as well because they need to come through the sides. Uh, and you don't want the seat belts to cut into the polyester because otherwise you're going to rip them over time. So, um, yeah, there's a couple of things to be done on this. These are the paddles. So we have the clutch pedal, the brake pedal and the throttle. And you can see they are pretty much forward. And I'm a short guy and... Uh, I'm only 1 meter 68. Well, I would like to say 1 meter 70, but, but I'm not. Anyhow, um, 1 meter 68 is fairly short and my feet just touch the paddles. Uh, of course, when I move the seat forward, it will be better, but not enough. Uh, and you need to tailor that to your own dimensions, really. If you're going to race with a car, you always have to do that. So what I will do is I will remove the front parts here and I make new bars that can extend a bit longer. Or maybe you bring it up to here, right? It's the same thing, and I'll do it for all the pedals. The throttle might be a little bit more of a problem to do it, but that will also work. So these things can all be sorted out fairly easily. It's a bit of work, but it can be done. And all the way in the front, we've got our brake uh, reservoirs for the front and the rear brakes and the clutch. These are still in a good condition, so I don't need to do much more on this. I will certainly change all the brake fluid, there's no doubt about that, and bleed the brakes while we're looking at the brake pads themselves. Here you see the front suspension, and these are Spax coilovers, adjustable. In a very good condition, the same thing is true in the back. I might just clean them up a little bit, but you can see all the leverage on how that is then going to the wishbones. And I have a whole video on explaining how the wishbones are working. We've got a bottom and a top wishbone here. Oh, still in a real good condition, so um, that is good. So the car is reasonable okay. Uh, there's a bit of cleaning up to be done, but normal maintenance and then a, a couple of corrections. But I had one major issue. And if you wonder if the car is not missing any body parts, well, it is actually, but I already have them removed, as you can see. They are just laying here patiently on the floor until they can get reinstalled. When I picked up the car, we actually started it up, made sure it was running fine, everything was okay. But last week, when I was about to start to work on this car, I tried to start it up and 
the shaft between the starter motor and the flywheel actually broke. Let me show you that. This is the starter motor and there is a shaft that fits on it. Here is that shaft and you can disconnect it with a bolt. So let me move this aside and then you can see what I mean. So this is then the shaft that flies forward and grips on the flywheel and this sits in the casing as support and guess what happened? This broke off. That's what happened. So we need to fix this and these parts you can't get. Luckily I got a friend of mine who has one so he's gonna give it to me which is very nice of him but I also want to rebuild this one. I know that I can get a replacement part from a friend of mine and that's really nice. But on the other hand, maybe I could even fix this. So one of the ways I could do it is by welding it up here all around. But it's going to heat up this uh, pinion here a lot and I'm not too keen on that. So maybe it's better if I turn a complete new uh, shaft. So that new shaft is now almost finished. I still have to drill a couple of holes, but before I do so, I just want to make sure that this pinion is going to fit. Now I have uh, grinded it off on the old bar or the old um, rod and see if that goes on very nice and smoothly. And here is that old rod and let's see where it's supposed to go. So this is about right there. So this will be just a perfect fit. Now, before I do anything else, I need to drill a couple of holes. So now we're going to drill the hole that will slide over the axle of the starter motor. And this is a 12 mil. Now, my lathe isn't very powerful. It's just a very cheap second-hand hobby lathe. So let's see if it fits onto the starter motor. Yeah, it just fits perfectly. And now we still need to drill the hole, of course, in here to put the bolt through. And then we need to weld on the pinion and we should be all set. The shaft is on and I got the bolt through, so that's good. Oh, it's uh, pretty cold outside. I don't know what's happening with global warming, but please give me some, because it's too cold for the time of the year. Okay, uh, now back to serious stuff. The shaft is almost complete. All I need to do now is to weld on that pinion, and this is what we're going to do next. So here is our shaft and our pinion. I'm just going to put it up. All right. And I need to make sure that I have the right distance, which is 110. So I'm just going to slide it up. And this stuff, guys, I did measure beforehand. So I know that this is the distance. And then I'm going to use a clamp on the shaft so that the pinion can't slide down. Okay. Right, all right, so let's see if we can get this done. I'm just gonna lock it in place and then we fully weld it. So that should be it. Uh, this is almost welded completely and full. Okay, so we are done. Uh, now we're gonna put it back onto the lathe um, to clean it up a little bit. I don't wanna cut off too much. I don't need to do a lot more than this. And I think uh, that it is quite okay 
looking on the line right there. Um, of course, you have some wobbling going on there, but that's not the pinion itself. That actually is wear and tear on the pinion, so different in shades. The shaft is now complete, and now we can install it on the starter motor and see if it's going to crank up. I would have loved to have a new pinion on it, but I don't have one, so we can't fit it up. But maybe I make one uh, the next time once I find a pinion like this. I have the starter motor installed, so now we should be able to test it out. All right, battery is a bit low. Okay, that sounds good. I'm quite happy with the result of the shaft. That seems to be working quite well. However, the gel battery that we had inside this car is gone. So I have to put in a new gel battery. Um, and then uh, I will start installing the seat. First, I wanna make sure that I can get the battery in the proper place. So I'm gonna stop this video for now and then I'll see you in my next episode uh, because there's gonna be a couple of episodes. So the battery fitment, the seed fitment, then also the adjustment of the pedals, and then all the other maintenance parts that we still have to do on this car. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.